Would Freddie Freeman really leave Atlanta? According to industry sources, it's starting to look more and more likely like that could be the case. Also, players and owners make marginal progress in CBA talks this week. And who are the college baseball prospects to keep an eye on as the college baseball season gets underway? We'll be talking about all of that on today's episode of Locked On Braves. So let's get into it. This is Stacey Gotsoulias, DC Lundberg, Ryan Finkelstein, Taylor Blake Ward, host of Locked On Yankees, Locked On Mariners, Locked On Mets, Locked On Angels, and you're listening to Locked On Braves. Locked On Braves. Locked On Braves. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hey, and welcome back to Locked On Braves, brought to you by the Locked On Podcast Network, where we talk about your favorite teams every day. I am your host, Jake Amastriani. You can follow me on Twitter at shortstopball. Check out my bio there to see everywhere I am covering the game of baseball, including the Atlanta Braves in written form over at tomahawktake.com. I also cover AA South for Prospects 1500 and the Birmingham Barons for Southside Sox. Also, please make sure that you follow the podcast on Twitter at LockedOn underscore Braves and subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcast. Make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube as well. And thanks for making Lockdown Braves your first listen each and every day. Right now, posting episodes three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday during the lockout. But once things pick back up, we'll be back to five days a week. So make sure that you are subscribed. Hopefully that's going to happen soon. And we'll talk about a little bit of that today with the CBA talks going on this week. Also going to talk about some new reports, I guess you could say, on Freddie Freeman and where he could be a leaning once the offseason continues. And then I want to talk about the college baseball season as well. Uh, look, I know we're all hungry for baseball of any form, and the college baseball season started this past weekend. I'm obviously a huge college baseball fan living in the Southeast. So we're going to talk about that, prospects to watch, who are some players the Braves could be targeting at 20 in the upcoming MLB draft. Well, let's start with the article from Buster Olney that sent everybody into a frenzy on Tuesday talking about Freddie Freeman and the view from the industry that he could potentially be leaving Atlanta. So I'm going to read just a snippet from that article that really is what had everybody talking on Tuesday. And in the article, it says the industry view has shifted in regards to Freddie Freeman ultimately going back to Atlanta. Only says there is a growing belief that Freeman will land somewhere outside of Atlanta because of the standoff in his negotiations. The Braves offered $135 million over five years, sources say, and Freeman is looking for a six-year deal. I think the Braves will move quickly to settle on an alternative, alternative and move on to get past the conversation, one official said. Um, and, and that's basically, you know, everybody on Tuesday talking about, you know, Freddie, is Freddie really going to leave? Could Freddie really go? I mean, look, it's gotten this far into the nego no negotiations, it's certainly very possible that Freddie Freeman will not re-sign with the Atlanta Braves and that he'll get a better offer. It has certainly become a competition at this point. You got to figure there are other teams who would love to have Freddie Freeman's services who would be willing to outbid the Braves here. And so if Freddie wants to go somewhere else, then he most likely will. But where I get a little frustrated with this article from Buster Olney and it's not just only, it, it, I mean, this has been going on since the lockout started. We've seen article after article. We talk about what if Freddie leaves. We've talked about it here on the podcast a lot. And it's just like, where's this information coming from? <laughs> we know the Braves don't let out anything in their front office. And where are these industry sources? Why are they all of a sudden getting a feeling that Freddie Freeman wouldn't sign with the Braves? That's That's got to just be an opinion based on the fact that a deal still hasn't been done. I can't really imagine there's people out there on the Braves side or elsewhere that are saying, Hey, it's looking like Freddie Freeman won't sign with the Braves. The two sides aren't even talking right now. So I think this is a little bit overblown. 
I, I think these are the people just who are assuming since a deal did not get done before the lockout that that to them means that Freddie Freeman will look elsewhere. And that very well could be the case. I mean, we've talked about on here a lot. The fact that a deal wasn't done last offseason, it wasn't done before this past season, that it wasn't done before a lockout tells us that there could not be a deal getting done between the two sides and that Freddie Freeman could go out elsewhere. I mean, that is obvious, but there's nothing that's changed during this lockout that is suddenly new information to say that Freddie Freeman could go elsewhere. It's it's somewhat you know boredom on the writer's part, and I get it. I'm a writer as well. I'm a podcaster. It's tough coming up with material right now, but I just honestly believe there's nothing that has changed during this lockout than what we knew going in. I still feel very optimistic that Freddie Freeman will sign with the Braves, but nothing has happened in the past week <laughs> that should make anyone believe any differently than they already did going into the lockout. It is an open competition for Freddie Freeman's services, and either the Braves will give in and they'll give him that six year or Freddie Freeman will give in himself and take that five year offer. Look, I've said all along, I think the Braves should give him six and one sixty, six and one sixty five, something like that. I think that's fair. And I think that gets it done. If Freddie wants more than that, then he'll sign somewhere else. I just don't see the Braves going beyond that limit right now. One thing is certain, and we've talked about this on here as well, and it's been written in the multiple articles that have been written on this during the lockout, things will move quickly. And, you know, the Braves have to move quickly. So I do think a resolution will be, um, will come swiftly as soon as the lockout is ended, whatever that may be. I think Braves are exploring all options, but I think their number one option will still be Freddie Freeman. They'll go back to him. Look, they had plenty of time to think about it, but I think they'll go back to him say, Hey, this is our, you know, last offer. This is where we stand. Um, accept it or, you know, take more somewhere else. And if he decides to go somewhere else, they'll pivot to another option. So speaking of other options, we've talked about that on here as well. You know, Matt Olson seems to be the top option, I still think that's going to be very expensive prospect-wise, and I just don't see Alex doing that. And for a guy who's under control for two years, um, and the Braves likely will have to do this all again in two years. I just, I don't know. Look, I, I would, Matt Olson is your best option if Freddie Freeman leaves. I get it. I just don't think that's as easy as a lot of Braves fans tend to believe, that if Freddie goes elsewhere, we'll, the, the Braves will just go get Matt Olson. It's not that simple. Next best, best option for me is Anthony Rizzo. Look, I think he'd be solid. He wouldn't be nearly as expensive, but he's not nearly as good as Freddie Freeman or Matt Olson. If you get Anthony Rizzo, you got to make upgrades somewhere else, whether you go get a, a Michael Conforto or somebody else for the corner outfield spots, you would have to make multiple moves. They may still have to make multiple moves even if they get Freddie back, but I think for sure you would have to make some other upgrades to the offense if you don't get Freddie Freeman or Matt Olson. Another option may be to go get Chris Bryant, move uh, Austin Riley to first base. I personally hate that idea. I don't want to mess with Austin Riley, uh, leave him there. But I mean, outside of those options, I mean, then, then it's just looking for the trade market and what's out there at first base. And, you know, I honestly don't know what is out there. I haven't dug into it that deeply. Um, but uh, there's just not, there's certainly not anything internal um, that the Braves have right now to step up in first base if Freddie Freeman goes. So, look, I, I'm at the point now where no matter what happens, I understand this is a business. And if Freddie moves on, he moves on. And I'll cheer for him wherever he goes, unless that's an NL East team. Uh, that's where I got to draw the line. But I love Freddie Freeman. I'm optimistic. I want the Braves to get him back. I certainly think that is the top option for me and should be for the Braves. Again, if it's me, I'd offer him six, 160, say, hey, leave it, take it or leave it. And if he leaves it, I, I feel fine with that. I feel like the Braves would have made a solid offer at that point. But it's a business. We all have to understand that as much as I want Freddie Freeman in Atlanta for life, it, it may not happen. It may not work out that way. And we have to prepare ourselves for that reality but nothing in that report from only or those sources make me feel more persuaded one way or the other nothing has changed since this lockout started uh, the Braves and Freddie Freeman both know where each other stand 
Um, and it's just what side will give in once this lockout ends. And if they, neither side gives in, then Freddie Freeman will sign up somewhere else. And I trust Alex Antopoulos to make the right decision. And if Freddie does move, I have faith in him that he will put a winning team together, that he'll find another way to put a winning team together. All right, this is the time of the year. I've pretty much given up on all my New Year's resolutions, but not this year. I'm sticking to my resolution to eat right, thanks to Built Bar. It almost feels like it's not a resolution at all because I actually enjoy eating them. And have you tried their puffs? If you haven't, you're missing out on one of Built Bar's best tasting bars. Puffs are the first ever protein infused marshmallow. They're fluffy, they're marshmallowy, they're not just a protein bar, they're a treat. And they're covered in 100% real chocolate, just like all Built Bars are. Low calorie, high protein, or place your candy bars with these. They are better. A typical candy bar can be anywhere from 200 to 300 calories, while most built bars contain 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, 4 net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. Mint brownie, coconut, coconut almond, and new for this month, white chocolate cookies and cream, which is delicious. Go to built.com, use promo code LOCKED15 and get 15% off your order. Again, use promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. All right, so owners and players have been getting together all week, which is great to try to hammer out these CBA negotiations. But honestly, through Tuesday, nothing has really changed. Both sides have made marginal moves towards the middle. Although you could argue with the proposal from the players on Tuesday, they took a step back by increasing the number for the minimum salary. But honestly, neither side has really made a significant move. There hasn't been much change from where we where we were before. Yes, it's progress, but progress at this pace would maybe get us a deal by the 2023 season. Good news is they'll continue to meet all week until they hopefully get a deal done before that February 28th deadline. To this point, there still has not been any talks about the CBT threshold, and I've still yet to have somebody explain to me why that is such a big deal for the players. I don't believe it should be, but it is, and they haven't talked about it yet, and apparently that's going to be the biggest battle. So until we get to those conversations, nothing's really going to get done. And look, I'm not on the owner's side. I'm not on the player's side. I've, I've told you all. Very much so, I don't like either side in these negotiations. But I have to think that even if the players accepted the owner's deal today, it would have to be a win for them. They're right now, by the owner's proposal, they're set to get about 60000 more per pre r player, zero to one year player. And they've gotten the owners to create another $20 million for pre r players. So that is a lot of money for younger players. And that was supposed to be the biggest issue coming into these negotiations. It's what players have been complaining about for years now. Fans have been complaining about to some degree is younger players who are putting up great numbers and making league minimum. That doesn't seem fair. And the owners have at least made steps to try to increase that, to help that out. So I still think right now, if a deal was made, I, th I still think it would be a good win for the players in terms of getting younger players paid. And that should be the biggest issue in these negotiations, in my opinion. I still think the league minimum could be raised even further than the 630000 that the owners are at right now, um, especially when you compare it to other leagues. You know, it should probably be somewhere 650, 670, and perhaps they get there in these negotiations. But I still think this is a great deal for younger players players again if you get that minimum up to 650 uh, somewhere in that range and you get the pre-r bonus pool to 30 40 maybe even 50 million that is a huge win for the players in my opinion and that's why i can't understand why they're so stuck on these the cbt threshold that is really only for the higher paid players and it's really only for four or five teams and i just don't understand why we're going to be stuck on this point why it's such a huge deal for the players when the big deal should be getting younger players paid what they're worth and i think they've made the owners have made significant progress towards that now i, I get it you know the players want more of the pie they should they always do they certainly earned it but 
again, just on my my knowledge of these negotiations, I think it's still a win for the players' side and the fact that they've gotten twenty million dollars that was not there before that can be given to younger players. That is a a big win in my mind for the players' side of things. Um, another thing to mention is that the owners propose four teams for a draft a lottery. The players are at seven. Again, not a big deal there. They'll they'll figure that one out. They'll meet at five or six, whatever. That's not a big deal. But I, I wanted to just sum it all by this, this tweet from Evan Drellich of The Athletic. He says, MLB believes players took a step back backwards today on Tuesday because of proposed raises to the minimum salary. Unions saw those increases as a counterweight to drop in ARB eligibility uh, eligibility from 80 to 75% of two-plus-year players. Players Association believed its move to be equivalent, in effect, to those MLB proposed a day earlier. And that last part is what I want to focus on because this is what these whole negotiations, quote-unquote, have been about, is that neither side's giving up much ground. It's been, you know... Five million here from one side, five million here from the other side. There's been no real significant ground made. And the excuse from the other side, well, that's what the players are doing. Well, that's what the owners are doing. So that's what we're going to do. And it's from a fan's perspective, for me, it just seems kind of childish from both sides, where it's just like they're giving us a bad offer. So we're going to give them a bad offer in return and we're going to get nowhere and we're going to have a delayed season. And that is frustrating. For me, uh, as a fan, you know, right now it's just who's going to blink first, who's going to give in, and who's going to make those significant steps towards getting a deal done. And until that happens, we're just we're not going to get a deal done, and we're not going to get baseball on time. And if the players really are dug in, because they are the ones that look, they have to stand strong if they want to really see significant change. The owners you know, have less to lose from a delayed season. If the players are really dug in and everything seems like they are, and they are not going to give in and give big gains in their proposals, then we're going to have a delayed season. That's just the bottom line. So that makes me a little bit worried that both sides are just at that point. Well, the other side's not playing fairly, so we're not going to either. And that just seems like where both sides are in negotiations. And that's just, it's hard to see as a baseball fan, but I'm still optimistic. Fingers crossed they will get a deal done by the February 28th deadline and the season will start on time. Let's all hope so. Football might be over, but basketball is in full swing with both pro and college hoops. From all the latest odds, totals, player performance props to where the next fired coach is going to land, BetOnline.net is the number one spot for all your sports betting needs. BetOnline remains the best spot for all of your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. And it's not just basketball. BetOnline.net is your source for hockey, boxing, and UFC odds right to the Olympic coverage and information. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. BetOnline, where the game starts. All right, so I want to end talking about something exciting as the college baseball season is underway. I love college baseball. You can't replicate the passion that these players play with and the fans do. Same with college football. It's so much better than the NFL experience, in my opinion. And you get that on a college baseball level as well. So I was so pumped with the college baseball season starting. Maybe the only baseball we get for quite some time. So if you are not a college baseball fan, I would suggest that you go check it out and give it a watch. But I want to talk about some of the best college prospects to keep an eye on leading up to the 2022 MLB draft where the Braves pick at 20. Unfortunately, the pitching prospects in college right now are just not very good. Um, Peyton Paulette or Arkansas and Connor Prelip of Alabama were two of the top pitching prospects, and both of them are already out for the season. Um, Blake Tidwell for Tennessee, a very big pitching prospect. And Carson Wisenhunt for East Carolina. There's a couple of pitchers for Florida State as well. I mean, the the best college pitcher is definitely up for grabs, and it'll be interesting to see as the season goes on who really steps forward there. But there are a ton of really good college bats in this draft class. Uh, Chase DeLotter from James Madison, Brooks Lee of Cal Poly, Gavin Cross, Virginia Tech, Chase Young, Texas Tech, Robert Moore of Arkansas, 
Brock Jones, Stanford, one of my favorite prospects, Daniel Susak, Arizona, Jacob Berry, LSU, Logan Tanner, Mississippi State, and Kevin Parada at Georgia Tech. So there are a lot of good bats in this draft class from the college ranks to keep an eye on. Georgia Tech is expected to have a really good team this year and has a lot of top prospects. So if you're in the Atlanta area there, go check out some Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets games. Obviously, Georgia will have some solid prospects as well in the SEC. Some targets for the Braves, some early targets for the Braves looking in the college ranks. You got to go to Wake Forest, right? I mean, that seems to be uh, where they are hunting prospects right now. Um, the top ranked Wake Forest pitcher is right handed pitcher Eric Adler, uh, who's serving as one of their closers right now. Um, so maybe that's somebody to keep an eye on as the season goes along. Perhaps they take a chance on an injured arm like Paulette or Prelip. I mean, Prelip was supposed to be a, a number one overall type contender uh, in this draft class. So it, Braves like to target some injured arms, players that are pitchers that have already been injured. So maybe they go after Paulette or Prelip at 20. Um, but like I said, there are a lot of good bats in here. I think that's where the Braves should be targeting are the bats. I don't know that Jacob Barry of LSU would fall to 20, but I would love to get him corner infielder, good power, good hit tool, shortstop Carter Young from Vanderbilt. I think could be a very good option. I think he'll, she should be available at 20, uh, very good defensive shortstop who showed a lot of power last year. So he's somebody uh, I would keep an eye on for the Braves at 20. Like I said, should be a lot of bats available. I think that's where the Braves probably should go, depending on how the draft plays out this year. But if you are living in a college baseball town or near one, go check out a game. Love the college baseball season, so make sure that you are tuned in to that. But that will do it for this episode of Locked On Braves. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Locked On underscore Braves. You can follow me at Shortstop Ball. Also, make sure you subscribe to the Locked On Braves podcast wherever you get your podcast, and we will talk to you next time.